Good morning, everyone. It is March 25th, and this is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. Um, and we are today talking about the global commitment waiver and the all payer, um, all payer accountable care organization update with Ina Backus, um, our health reform director in the AHS, and Elena Barubi from the Green Mountain Care Board. So um, committee, before we get started, uh, just uh, to let you know uh, two things. One, I guess one is for witnesses and folks who are, are, are watching who are potential witnesses to try to be sure to, no, don't try, but please do get your testimony in at least 24 hours before the committee meeting. Uh, Nellie has a is the one who posts this. And so it takes her time. And in the beginning of our meeting, she is extremely busy and then she's busy throughout the, the meeting time. So it's important to get that testimony in. And committee members, we're, we're been pretty good about being on time. So no comment there, it's good. Uh, Senator Terenzini will be a bit late. Senator Cummings uh, is not here for personal reasons so we can We'll begin the committee with our uh, our loyal three. Oh, we're good. So, welcome. Um, I, I I'm not sure you two have you two coordinated at all, or are we? Um, I think you have at least on the accountable care organization piece. So I'll turn it over to you and let you introduce yourselves for the record, and then we have testimony from you on our web page. There you go. Good morning. For the record, my name is Ina Backus. I'm the Director of Healthcare Reform in the Agency of Human Services. Before we get started, I, I do want to clarify, Senator Lyons, we, we, we discussed that we would um, present the global commitment uh, testimony at another time so that we could use today's time in full for the all payer model discussion. Oh, thank you for that reminder. I, yes, I know we did that. And uh, I just, it was my, my, on my end, I failed to let Nellie know that that would, that would be the case, but we're fine. Good. Great. All right. Okay. And I am Elena Baraby, Director of Health Systems Policy at the Green Mountain Care Board. Great. I, I think that it, um, would be the practice for me to share my screen as I present. Okay, so Nellie, can you give um, Ina the share screen? Uh, she should already have that capability. Okay, there you go. Which one are we looking at that we have two, we have one under your name, Ina, and one under Alina's name. This is the one that is under my name and hopefully you're able to see it at this yes, point. Yes, we, we can. Great. So today, uh, Elena and I um, certainly can uh, be co-presenters and if, if that's all right with the committee um, and for, for me to invite Elena to fill in where she has particular expertise and vice versa as we talk through the information um, with you. The, the topic for today's testimony is the All Payer Model Accountable Care Organization Agreement. And I think there are, are a few things that we'd like to focus on, uh, certainly, providing some uh, description of what this agreement is um, and why we are pursuing this particular healthcare reform activity in the state of Vermont, as well as um, sharing with you some of the experience at this time in the agreement and where um, based on that experience, we have identified areas for improvement in the agreement through um, what we published in November at the Agency of Human Services, which is called the um, Implementation Improvement Plan for the All-Payer Model Agreement. 
And that plan, uh, it has a number of recommendations in it for how we can improve in our implementation of this model, um, both in terms of our own um, success here in Vermont, but certainly in keeping with the contract that we have with the federal government so that Medicare can participate in this model with us, which is something that I'll also um, spend some time talking about the uniqueness of that contract with Medicare uh, and the importance of Medicare participating in payment reform on Vermont's terms. To ground the conversation, I want to talk about the kind of healthcare reform that the all payer model is. Our healthcare system in the United States and, and in the state of Vermont is a large portion of our economy and is a, a complicated system. And so there are multiple areas of healthcare system reform um, that that at different times require different attention. The all payer model uh, is a type of healthcare reform that focuses on payment reform, which we'll talk more about, and delivery system reform. Payment reform intended to curb healthcare cost growth and delivery system reform intended to improve quality and population health and also uh, to curb healthcare cost growth. This all-payer model and our agreement with the federal government for Medicare's participation in it is not a is not a healthcare reform project that collects money differently, that finances healthcare differently than today, or that provides for healthcare coverage differently than today. This is a model um, that is not focused on those aspects of the healthcare system. Another place where this model doesn't currently have an influence is with respect to prescription drug spending and prescription drug um, uh, and prescription drugs as a driver of healthcare cost increase. So the while the, the model is incredibly important in stabilizing our healthcare system in curbing healthcare cost growth, it is not addressing all areas of the healthcare system um, as as a reform uh, as a reform project. The the all payer model is focused on changing how we pay for and deliver healthcare, and and that is because the healthcare system today is largely it largely remains a fee for, for fee for service system where each and every service that is delivered through the healthcare system is reimbursed and it is reimbursed uh, regardless to quality or outcomes for an individual. Instead of reimbursing for each and every, every service, regardless of the quality or outcomes, the all-payer model is moving Vermont towards a statewide system of care in which we in which we establish a budget for the healthcare system uh, through participating in alternative payment models uh, that and that we and and in fact we provide for the healthcare system spending uh, prospectively um, and this is happening in our Medicaid program now and I, I will elaborate on that as we go through the presentation um, but we're trying to move Vermont towards a system of prospective payment, upfront payment for healthcare services that then providers working together to coordinate quality and care work within that budget and, and are at risk uh, if their cost of healthcare delivery, delivery exceeds, that, exceeds that budget. The, this budget, very importantly, is tied to the quality of care delivered and to improved health outcomes, which, which establishes it firmly within, um, the, within the thinking of an alternative payment model and an, an alternative um, to fee-for-service payment model that is not simply a capitation or a return 
um, to to what you may um, know as the HMO area era, where um, healthcare spending was simply capitated, and then there was an incentive to reduce the delivery of services, or perhaps to, uh, for lack of a better word, skimp on the delivery of services. This model really differs from an HMO model um, or the HMO models that were uh, active in the 1990s because this model ensures that care is delivered in a high quality way, that appropriate services are delivered, and that their services aren't being denied um, to individuals uh, that, that require them. The federal government um, is also very focused on paying health for healthcare differently. And through the Healthcare Payment and Learning Action Network, the, our partners at CMS uh, look at moving away from fee-for-service using the framework that I'm sharing with you here. And you can see that this framework for alternative payment models, it really describes um, a, a trajectory that moves away from what I described as fee-for-service payment without any link to quality or, or value towards a system where payments are made on a population base, basis and payments are linked to quality and are linked to value. In Vermont, we have made progress all the way into category four of this, of this framework. And so naturally moving left to right, the, fr the framework um, is moving towards a system um, that is as divorced, if you will, as possible from the fee-for-service system that we have today that drives um, volume of services and that doesn't necessarily focus on the best quality and outcomes. In, in our Medicaid alternative payment model program in particular, um, we are, are able to provide for um, population-based payments that are paid prospectively to providers. Whoops. I didn't mean to move on so quickly, um, but uh, I will. So Vermont has Vermont has an agreement with the federal government, and it's through this agreement that we are we are endeavoring to realize the shift away from fee for service to an alternative payment model. And I want to emphasize that we are we are in a very small group of states. And we very uniquely have Medicare participating in our state program uh, on, on our terms. So consistent with Vermont's vision um, for shifting risk to providers, um, for paying providers differently. We have more work to do to uh, work, work to do to structure our Medicare program specifically um, so that it can mirror more so our Medicaid program. I'll talk, I'll talk about that as we continue through, um, but I do want to highlight the importance of Vermont being able to innovate and uh, include a federal uh, payer program, Medicare, um, which Medicare largely pay, pays fee for service um, nationally. Uh, Medicare um, doesn't, doesn't do things differently. It's very standardized. So for Medicare to be operating differently in our state is, is a very important relationship. Now, our, our model in Vermont is called the All-Payer Accountable Care Organization uh, Model Agreement. And our, so it, Accountable care organizations are central to our agreement with Medicare to reimburse providers differently than fee for service. Accountable care organizations are composed of and led by healthcare providers who have agreed to be accountable for the cost and quality of care for a defined population. These providers share governance and work together to provide coordinated and comprehensive care for their patients. Vermont, again, uniquely um, has 
one ACO that's operating in the state of Vermont. And you are probably you're familiar with One Care Vermont. It has one ACO operating in the state. It is also unique in that it is a statewide ACO. One Care has participants in its network that are that are statewide across across our our state. Uh, there we also have this is an ACO that includes hospital and physician practices as well as home health services, as well as designated and specialized services agencies. The agency, uh, the ACO has a, has a broad complement of providers and an incredible opportunity for those providers to coordinate uh, care across, across different care settings. Under the all payer model, ACOs are organizations that can accept Medicare's fee-for-service alternative payments. Again, Medicare is agreeing to pay differently than fee-for-service here in Vermont. However, through this agreement, the only way Medicare can pay differently or will pay differently is by providing that alternative payment to an accountable care organization. The accountable care organization is also a structure that can share in savings between its participating providers. Um, that structure allows, allows for those uh, shared savings to be uh, shared and for providers to work together. Whereas uh, if providers are not coordinated and organized in the ACO, there are concerns for providers in, in this regard when it comes to um, antitrust uh, law and um, uh, gain sharing provisions. In Vermont's uh, agreement, um, we, we, through our agreement, can see and, and can enjoy Medicare participating differently in healthcare reimbursement in our state. In order for Medicare to do that, certainly the federal government is looking for things in return for that flexibility. And the federal government, similarly to the state of Vermont, is interested in healthcare cost growth moderation. So we have through our agreement targets for healthcare cost growth moderation that are specific to Medicare, but that also apply to all payers uh, that are to all payers um, and to healthcare spending on behalf of Vermonters who are covered by all payer types in, in the state. The, the this is important for Vermont for our goals of moderating our overall healthcare spending growth. It's also important to acknowledge here that Medicare is making a bet that when other payers are participating in an aligned payment reform project, that that project will have more momentum and will have more likelihood of success. When we negotiated this agreement, with the federal government in now 2016, there was the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which is an innovation engine that is, that is a focus on developing alternative payment models and alternatives to fee-for-service. Their very strong hypothesis was that a model that includes these alternatives across different payer types. So instead of Medicare being the only coverage that pays differently, Medicare is joined by Medicaid coverage in paying differently and by commercial coverage in paying differently. Because in our state and in our national healthcare system, we don't all have the same type of healthcare coverage. There are providers are being paid differently by different types of healthcare coverage. Uh, and by different, and, and, and also through a variety of different contracts with commercial payers like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and MVP as examples. The Excuse federal me. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, can I ask a clarifying question of Ina? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Ina, this is Ruth, um, if you can't see me. Um, I can't, thank you. <laughs> um, 
so I'm looking at the um, the percentage growth that is agreed on in the model um, or in the in the agreement. There's for for all payer the compounded annualized growth rate of 3.5 percent, and then the Medicare growth rate target 0.2 percent below national projections. Could you explain those a little bit? Because they're not obviously comparing apples to oranges um, in terms of what they're a percentage of, correct? Yes, that's correct. That's that's absolutely right. Um, the all payer growth target is first of all, um, we we measure this growth based on those services that are included in the agreement. And um, Elena may elaborate on this as well, but we refer to those as, as total cost of care. So total cost of care rough, roughly looks like hospital and physician services. Um, it also does include um, mental health and substance use disorder services. But if you think of it as a, a, a bucket of services that are subject to this growth rate. Um, that's what's included in the all payer growth target. It's a, it's a bucket of services that's largely similar across the different participating payer types, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial payers. And again, it looks, it, it, it can be categorized as hospital and physician services. It doesn't include prescription drug spending as okay. an so then what is the, that's the 3.5%, that's what the you just described. Okay, so what's the 0.2% measured on? The 0.2% below is measured on the same bucket of services. So the services are the same, but what, what Medicare is looking for is for Vermont's Medicare spending. So hospital and physician services only, not Part D Medicare for that spending to grow 0.2 percentage points below what the national projections are. So it's not actually growth below the actual Medicare, it's growth below projections of Medicare spending um, for the, the performance period of the model agreement. Okay, all right, that's helpful. And I'm assuming at some point you'll get to how we're doing compared to these in your presentation? Like, are we hitting these targets, basically? I think that Elena is going to be able to talk about the Green Mountain Care Board's role in it, specifically in um, tracking progress against these targets. And yes, we will be able to. OK, thank you. That. As I was as I was explaining in terms of the importance of the of the um, multiple payers uh, participating. That's certainly something that we believe would improve, um, that improves the incentive for providers to deliver services differently and to do so more efficiently. If, if revenue for providers is as aligned as possible uh, across different payer types, and if incentives are aligned as possible across different payer types, then the likelihood that the delivery system will uh, transform to live within those different changed incentives, the likelihood is higher. The other important- Ina, Ina um, before you get to the other important, <laughs> I think, um, the alignment has always been a, an issue in a lot of different ways. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit about what you mean by alignment among all payers and what what sort of provisions, rules, guidelines um, we're, we're talking about. That'd be helpful. And Senator Alliance, could I ask a question as well? Of course. Oh, interrupted. Thank you. Thank you. And Ina, um, it's Cheryl Hooker. Um, how do the hospitals fit into this? I mean, with hospitals still paying, you know, 85% of their services are fee for service. How, how is it fitting into um, these growth projections? And maybe the alignment will talk well, about that. <laughs> well, alignment, so uh, hold on that, hold that thought. Um, why don't we answer the alignment question first and then go right to the hospital question because that's a, it's a slightly different, I think, so. That's up to Ina, but these are excellent. These are excellent questions, and alignment 
is a very important concept in this agreement in, a, in multiple ways. Uh, because we have different types of payers in our system with different sets of rules and regulations, providers ha have to have, for lack of a better word, elaborate systems to be able to meet the rules and regulations of all the different payer types. That's one type of alignment that we're looking for in this agreement in, in aligning the, the rules across payer types as much as possible to include how payers are looking at the quality of services delivered by providers. And that's one of, I think, the uh, major, I would call it one of the major successes of this agreement for participating accountable care organizations. We have a very aligned set of quality measures. The quality measures are are all in service of improving access to primary care, reducing deaths to due to suicide and drug overdose and reducing prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease. And there's been a very concerted effort for the quality measures to look as similar as possible for each of the payers that the ACO has a contract with so that there can be a clear message from those payers about where the uh, areas for focus on quality are and so that there can be um, that there can be the resources can be devoted um, more strategically uh, to improve in those quality areas versus each payer coming at the contract completely from their own um, completely from their own set of, of priorities and may perhaps not necessarily um, not necessarily seeing the priorities of other payers and how working in alignment can can improve the ability of the healthcare system to respond uh, to those priorities. So that's that's one type of alignment that this agreement looks for. There's other examples of alignment that the agreement looks for um, to include the to include the aligning as much as possible in terms of alternative payment models. So there is not complete alignment. The payer contracts do look different uh, in terms of, of paying differently than fee for service. However, there are some, some key principles um, in terms of the uh, amount of sharing of savings um, that has to be realized uh, in these payer contracts. Um, and some other some other key areas of alignment. The Green Mountain Care Board does look in, and has to look at the degree of alignment across the payer contracts as part of their role in, in assessing the progress in this model and the uh, degree of alignment in, in payer contracts is also important for the purposes of administrative simplification uh, for providers who are participating and, and, and again, who have multiple payer contracts and to the degree that they can be similar or the same in what they require of the providers, that is an opportunity for administrative simplification and, and potentially saving. So is that, do, do you need examples, other examples? I'm, I'm, I'm asking the committee now because the, the alignment piece can, can go on and on and on, but I'm just wondering if, uh, if you have questions about some specific boots on the ground examples. Uh, Senator Lyons, I'm, I'm just wondering who determines these alignments if all of these payers are, are doing different things, who's going to say, you know, and do they have to agree to these alignments <laughs> with what comes out of the Green Mountain Care Board, the ACO? I mean, who determines this? So can I just, can I just uh, give you um, just an example of the stress about trying to do this? And that is, um, I can remember a committee meeting where we had all, everyone in talking about alignment and it we talked about one federal rule and how could we get private payers to be more in line with federal a federal guideline um, 
it's it it some of it is by agreement simply by agreement between and among the the payers so and then because this is this is a voluntary the aco is voluntary all the across the board so having we also have federal rules that need to be followed so then you're ask you're asking private payers like blue cross and blue shield to adhere to federal rules and guidelines it becomes a negotiated process so it's the payer folks and you know, I'll let you carry it on further. I just, just that this, we've been trying to align for a long time and it's not easy. <laughs> the, the Green Mountain Care Board through this agreement is required to operate the Medicare, the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative. And through operating that, the Green Mountain Care Board can actually shape that initiative so that usually Medicare is, is can think of Medicare as very rigid and, and you just have to follow by Medicare's rules because Medicare um, is, is a large federal payer and it kind of sets the pace. In this case, because we have an agreement with Medicare, the Green Mountain Care Board can actually uh, shape how Medicare participates in this model to a degree. It has to be approved by the federal government. It's not just do whatever you want, but there is flexibility for the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative to be tailored in a way and more aligned with how uh, perhaps our Medicaid program functions in the state and perhaps how our commercial um, programs are functioning in the state. So that's, that's, a, that's a really key aspect of this agreement, whereas typically there would be nothing we could do in terms of a Medicare requirement through this agreement. We can we can shape how Medicare participates, um, and that is that is pretty unusual flexibility. Um, I think it was Senator Hardy who asked about performance and in, in the agreement, and and if we were going to talk about that, I do want to talk about performance in terms of scale. There are scale, scale targets in this agreement. The agreement looks for the preponderance of Vermont residents to be attributed to this alternative payment model um, by the end of the five-year performance period. And it looks for that because um, it's, it's important that we shift payment for, for providers as much as we possibly can in order for providers to be able to adjust their business models to a system where their revenue is where they're at risk for where they're at risk and where their revenue is not based only in a in a fee for service model. And so Senator Hooker, I think you were pointing to this by asking about how this is working when when many payments are still in fee for service. And it, it's, it's a reality that a much of the system is still uh, being reimbursed through the fee-for-service model and that we haven't realized our scale targets for this agreement. However, uh, we, and, we and, and the state of Vermont received a, a letter to that effect uh, late in the fall and in part, that letter was what prompted our implementation improvement planning process. Um, and, and we replied to CMS with recommendations that were included in our implementation improvement planning, which CMS has, has accepted um, as an as acceptable approach for us to try to improve progress in this area. But scale is, but scale is very important um, because the the incentives again need to be aligned as possible for providers to have one one revenue model that relies on more and more more and more customers so to speak more and more services being delivered instead uh and instead of uh, a model where their revenue comes uh prospectively 
and then they they are they have their revenue um it is guaranteed and then they work within that budget um it is very difficult to work in both of those worlds so to make the adjustments to live within a budget it's very hard to do that when you still in fact rely on fee for service revenue so that's why the scale targets are very important in this agreement and I want to talk about uh, how scale is achieved and then talk about what scale looks like in our Medicaid program and how we can use that Medicaid program as somewhat of a barometer, if you will, for what things start to look like when you have more scale of participation. This agreement um, has a scale target. The scale target is a function of individuals who are attributed to the accountable care organization. And an individual isn't attributed to an accountable care organization unless two things are true. The payer has to be participating with an ACO. So whoever my, uh, so I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I'm a state employee. And so the state employee, um, the state employee uh, plan was not participating uh, with the ACO previously, they are now. So previously I was not attributed to the ACO. Now as a state employee in the plan, I can be attributed to the ACO because the state employee plan is my healthcare coverage and it has a, has a contract and is participating with the ACO. The other, but my provider also has to be participating with the ACO for me to be attributed. So if my provider doesn't, doesn't participate with the ACO, isn't a part of the ACO network, then I won't be attributed even though my payer is participating. So my payer needs to participate and my provider needs to participate for me to be attributed to the ACO. And participation- Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about why is it that we can't have um, a prospective payment system where it's just um, related to the payer? The payer is going to pay in that way, whether or not a provider is participating in the ACO. The, well, the, 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 In this model, the scale is realized by eight Vermonters who are attributed to an ACO. So for scale to be realized, um, the payer can't only, the, the Vermonter has to be attributed to the ACO and largely the way a Vermonter is attributed, uh, attributed to the ACO is if there is a provider participating in the ACO. But I guess my question is that, is this, um, I mean, theoretically, uh, a payer, a private payer, for example, or uh, a Medicaid could decide to pay through an, an all payer uh, system where it's a, it's a payment per member per month. But, yes. the, but the value of having it go, be a, a ACO provider is the, the collection of quality and uh, clinical data that helps to inform whether or not this is a value-based program. Yes, and those providers who are participating in the ACO can use that information to deliver care um, that is more efficient and is of a higher quality. There, the, the Medicaid program is, is attributing uh, some Vermonters um, for participation in the ACO that may not have a participating provider. However, those, but largely the attribution method methodology is through provider. And that is the case for Medicare as well as it is for Medicaid. I, uh, Senator Hooker has a question. Yeah. yeah, I'm just confused. So your part um, you know, of the, the VSEA as part of the, um, as a participant in the ACO. 
but you are not obliged to use participating providers? Correct. As a as a as a Vermonter, I can I can choose whoever I want to see for my primary care provider. Um, and if my primary care provider is not participating with the ACO, then I won't be attributed. But if you're a Medicaid um, individual, does that provider have to participate in the ACO? No. Uh, um, there are there are some Medicaid uh, members that do not have a provider, um, and there's work underway to to uh, align those Medicaid individuals with a provider. When there isn't a provider, they they can be attributed to the ACO. Okay. Thank you, Sen Senator Hooker. Did that answer your question? Was, it, was yeah, there clarity yeah. with that? Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to um, put these together. It just sounds to me like a single payer would be a, an easier thing to do, but that's another discussion. Well, so um, the, yeah, to I know. Think, how that is. think of, can, go, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Think of what? Think of the, the, the value that is associated with having a quality metric analysis. In other words, when treatment is given to the patient, that information is collected and looked at. And then gradually, if it's a substance use disorder or access to primary care or it, um, related to suicide, uh, those are the things that are being measured right now. It, that information goes back into the quality database at the ACO, and over time, the treatment for those individuals improves. Mm -hmm. So but, that I mean, so that's something that's not in, not included other places. This is this is pretty unique mm -hmm. uh, to our to our uh, work. But so, isn't you know, it the dependent? Work. Isn't it dependent upon the pay or the provider's participation as far as the data collection? That's a question for Ina. Yeah. This, so I have this bullet here that says participation is, is largely voluntary and, and it really is almost exclusively voluntary. The, the, the one place where it's not is that the Vermont, um, Department of Vermont Health Access does need to offer per our agreement. We, we signed a contract that commits the Department of Vermont Health Access to offer an alternative uh, payment model contract to an accountable care organization. Of course, the uh, Department of Vermont Health Access has to, it does, it does have to offer that uh, and wants to do so and we'll talk more about why it's beneficial to do so. But I, I highlight that um, that if an ACO doesn't want to sign up with that, it doesn't have to. So for the most part, this model is entirely voluntary. It's voluntary for providers to choose to participate um, in coordination as an ACO. It's voluntary for providers to join the ACO. It's voluntary for payers that are not Medicaid, so it's voluntary that for commercial payers to offer um, ACOs a qualifying contract, a contract that would meet the all payer model uh, uh, standards, if you will. And, and therefore would collect the data from them, from those providers, but otherwise not? The, well, um, the provider's participation in the ACO, um, providers in their contracts with commercial payers have, um, there are quality metrics included in those contracts with, with commercial payers. Um, even if they are not contracting in the ACO, there are cer certain quality metrics. They may not be uh, aligned with the quality metrics that we're focusing on in terms of improving access to, um, you know, the quality measures that have been identified in this model, 
there are metrics between payers and providers. It, you, the metrics don't exist only in an ACO contract is I guess what I should say. Okay, thank you. So I wanna highlight that providers who do participate can benefit from the option to be paid a different way. And we saw this benefit play out in the uh, pandemic when our Medicaid program uh, was providing upfront monthly payments to providers. Um, if those providers had been being paid traditional fee for service through the Medicaid program and Medicaid uh, beneficiaries were not seeking services as many were not during the pandemic, those those healthcare providers would have seen their revenue fall away. And we did see, and healthcare providers have experienced revenue decline because uh, people have not been seeking see services in the same way during the pandemic and where people have a payer that's paying fee for service, that means no, no dollars are coming in the door. If a provider is paid alternatively to fee for service and has a budget, and has a budget provided upfront, that means the provider can continue to um, be open, uh, that the provider can maintain its capacity to care for people when people may be returning um, to seek services. And it provides predictability and stability for the providers that otherwise would not exist if the only way that providers uh, make make money or are paid is when someone walks in the door and and is delivered a service. It creates a budget for our healthcare system. You know, can I ask a clarifying question on that? So you said that Medicare provided those payments to providers. Is that right? Did I hear you or was it Medicaid? Medicaid provides Medicaid. Okay. The, fixed, the fixed payment. Yes. Okay. So who the fixed payments that go to par providers that are participating in the ACO, do they come from the individual payers or do they come from the ACO itself? The the payments the the payment the the fixed payments are made to the, are are for the ACO. So yes. And then the ACO distributes them to providers. Correct. Okay. Thanks. Participation also allows for access to data and analytic, anal, analytics to support decision-making and quality performance, access to tools and resources that support care delivery that the Accountable Care Organization makes available to participating providers, um, access to funding to support more coordinated care, and because the ACO, the Accountable Care Organization, is a statewide network with a variety of provider participants. There are shared learnings um, that can be uh, uh, that that are a benefit to participation um, from a statewide network of providers. So going back to the back to scale. I said that we had um, not met the scale targets to, for the agreement. We didn't meet the targets in terms of all payer scale. We didn't meet the targets in terms of Medicare scale. However, here in this graph, I want to demonstrate the scale of participation in our Medicaid program. The Medicaid program, again, is offering fixed prospective payments to providers. Um, Whereas uh, the Medicare program is, is offering a prospective payment, but it isn't fixed. It's reconciled to actuals, which makes it less attractive and more complicated for providers. And uh, the commercial um, contracts include risk for ACOs, but do not include uh, prospective payments at this time. Where we are offering the most aggressive move away from fee for service and um, the most significant transition to a different Medicaid uh, and revenue model, you can see that Medicaid participation is, um, is by far in a way the most uh, robust. So in our Medicaid program, we've seen 
um, the the number of beneficiaries that are included in this model grow significantly since first offering a, um, a model with the ACO and, and that has stayed uh, very high compared to the other pairs. So when we look at how are we going to, we've, we've been told we're not performing well on scale. You saw that we're not performing up to the targets. When we think about how we improve on those targets, I think it, we looked to, and I think it continues to look to our Medicaid program as a model for how we might improve. Um, in the Medicaid model, I wanted to share a few, a few pieces of experience. Um, in, and so the Medicaid model is not only a benefit for providers because the providers uh, can rely on revenue um, through this model and it is predictable and stable. Also because the uh, payments to the providers that are aligned in the ACO are fixed, that means that the payer, our Medicaid program, also experiences predictability and stability in terms of budget and planning. In 2019, Diva and OneCare agreed on the price of health care upfront, and actual spending was more than expected. From the payer perspective, this, this is another benefit of the model. The payer is sharing that risk, the financial risk with one care, and therefore one care has to pay for a portion of the spending that was in excess of the agreed upon price. In the fee for service world, uh, if spending was more than, the, than expected, the payer pays for that additional, um, those additional services and that additional intensity of services. Perhaps it's a mix of more services and more costly services that drive the spending over what was expected. If, if it's a fee-for-service model, the, the healthcare payer is responsible for paying more than what it anticipated. In the, in the alternative to fee-for-service model, that um, overage is not entirely uh, the responsibility of the payer. And in fact, it is in part the responsibility of the providers, which is what creates the incentive for the providers to manage um, more, more efficiently. But when when there are, are patterns in care um, and so on that, that cannot necessarily be managed within the, within the spending, again, it provides protection to the payer um, in terms of that, total, of that total cost. We also see another very helpful trend um, in the DIVA contract. And again, I, I'm sorry to sound like a broken record, but I think it's such a crucial difference um, in, in, our, in our payment models and is also um, such groundbreaking experience that it's worth talking about um, where DIVA pays the ACO prospectively instead of fee for service. So it has, a, it, it, it's, there are still some services that are paid for fee for service but that are at risk. But there's a, there's a large portion where there's only the prospective payment. So when there's only a prospective payment, we see that uh, those providers who are receiving the prospective payment spend less than expected on the services that are within their control. We, that means that within that the providers are working within the budget to deliver care more efficiently. And that, that's, that's a exciting trend for us to be able to see now at with three years of the prospective payment underway, that when providers receive a, a prospective payment, the amount of services delivered within that payment um, are, are managed within, within the budget. Some more benefits um, from the Medicaid program in particular, which I wanna share um, because I 
because they, these benefits really drive how we think about improving overall in our model. We wanna think about how we can make more aspects of the Medicaid program aligned with our other payer program. The, the Medicaid program has, um, has provided more certainty in budgeting. Um, there is more payment predictability um, within the program, uh, which builds stability over time. The prospective um, payments, again, that trend really um, shows that there is a, a lot of potential in changing the financial incentives, that when the financial incentives are changed, that um, care is managed differently within those financial incentives. We've also seen through the Medicaid program that there have been incremental improvements in quality performances, in quality performance, and changes in the delivery and coordination of care. And finally, um, this we certainly want to see and take the opportunity to continue testing and evolving this model in our Medicaid program um, because of the predictability that it offers, but importantly, in our other payer programs as well. So if, um, if, it, if it makes sense at this point, I can talk about how the implementation improvement plan, um, what its recommendations include and how they are modeling after the Medicaid experience, or I can take a break. Yeah, no, I think taking a break is a good idea. It's been a heavy lift. It's a lot of information. Um, and I think we're, we're going to have to, uh, my, the goal here today is simply understanding. I mean, it's not co doing comparative analysis with any other healthcare reform initiative. What we're trying to do is to understand what is going on and the, and the, the parts that are working, and then you've identified some areas for improvement. I think that is absolutely key. So, but so I think it's a good place to uh, maybe um, switch over to the regulatory board and have uh, have Elena talk about that work. Of uh, there may be questions before we do that from committee members. Not seeing questions. Well, I have a lot of questions, but I don't. I don't know if I know. No, I'm good. That's good. I mean, Cheryl, um, that's excellent. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I'm. I don't know. We're talking about the Medicaid model, and on the chart, it looked like it was eighty percent of. Uh, can you explain the 80%? eighty percent? Eighty eighty percent, roughly, of Medicaid beneficiaries in the state of Vermont are attributed to the alternative payment model. Okay, so there's twenty percent left that we could look at in the Medicaid model, ostensibly that could join the ACO. Is that? Uh, the, yeah, there's a, correct. There's more. There could be more Medicaid um, beneficiaries. Uh, Full en enrollment Medicaid beneficiaries attributed to the model um, based probably on who their primary care providers are and whether their primary care are participants in the model. Um, I, I am hedging a little bit here because I think there's also, um, we know that when a person is duly eligible, so eligible for Medicaid and Medicare, that mm -hmm. person is attributed to the Medicare program um for, so the medicare program is where the where that individual would be attributed okay so <laughs> for the program to work and meet its goals we're going to have to rely on medicare and commercial insurers in, insured and everybody to join the group right correct to improve our performance in this model we need to see more participation in the commercial and the medicare spaces okay. yes okay. and in the past couple of years that hasn't happened there's been incremental improvement but we have not seen the scale of participation that we see in our medicaid program and so the loss that the aco um, experienced has been absorbed by one care by the ACO? I, I'm not sure I understand oh, wow. that question. Um, there Has there been, well, 
has there been a loss in in like 2019? Wasn't there a, a loss to the system as far as I don't know, whether it's reaching the goal, not reaching the goal? Is that you know? Yeah, I think there's a there's a difference, a difference a difference between um, thinking about loss and thinking about whether or not the the ACE there. So for the Medicaid program, I was describing that. Um, the spending exceeded the target. Yeah, that's, and that, that's the question I needed. <laughs> yes. And so I wouldn't, I don't think of that as a loss. Um, and I would invite Elena to talk about this more as well, because the Green Mountain Care Board um, analyzes the, the budget for the ACO, but it, I wouldn't categorize that or term that as, as a loss. It's, it's um, liability that the ACO has for exceeding the, the target. Okay, thank you. Exceeding the payer target, right? So there's a there's the agreements between the ACO and the payer, and they have financial targets, and then there's the target, the three point five percent and the two point or you know two basis points. That's the all payer and the Medicare target for the state, so regardless the, of ACO participation. The payment for that overage comes out of the ACO the to the payers. Yes. Yeah. So. Okay. And really the providers. <laughs> yeah. Comes out of the providers. So is this the risk that we talk about? Yes, the yes. providers are at risk for their performance. The risk. Okay. Okay. And okay. We'll we'll talk about hospitals and stuff later too, I'm sure. Okay. Thanks. Well, yeah. So uh, maybe Elena can answer some of those questions. I'm looking at our time, Elena. I know we're, we're going to have to come back to this because I think it is complex, uh, but it's also important to understand. I, I, I do have a question for, for you, um, and because Senator Hooker uh, brought it up and was talking about single payer, but this doesn't obviate the potential for everyone to be covered under a single system. This is... The this is a healthcare cost growth moderation and quality improvement model. Right. And it does not, it, the One Care Vermont is not a type of healthcare coverage. Um, and this is not a healthcare coverage model. Right. It does seek to align how healthcare coverage works in terms of how healthcare payers pay for healthcare, but it's not about covering individuals for healthcare. But it also might be about how how many days you have to wait before um, you get approval for a specific procedure. You could have clinical alignment issues. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, Elena, why don't you just go right ahead and then... Okay. I, I know that we're going to have both of you back another time because this is a very, uh, this is a rich area uh, and I think it's important that we understand it. So go ahead, Elena. Okay. And, and I'm looking at our time. Uh, we're going to have a fast stop at 1025. It is 1005. Whatever you, uh, I think, cover the things that you think are most critical for sure. us. Sure. And then uh, we'll, we'll, we will have you back. Okay. Sounds great. Um, so, you know, we focused on the Green Mountain Care Board's role, um, just to give you some background on, you know, broadly in healthcare reform, the board regulates certain private healthcare entities uh, to support the state's broader goals of curbing healthcare cost growth and quality improvement. Um, we are also the stewards of healthcare data and analytics that look across payers and across populations. Um, in the all payer model agreement, there's kind of three key areas that we focus on. So as a proxy for Medicare, I think Ina talked a little bit about the Green Mountain Care Board's ability to um, suggest, um, you know, in, in agreement with the, our other co-signatories, suggest some adjustments to the Medicare ACO initiative. It, um, the Green Mountain Care Board also facilitates kind of regulatory alignment between our hospital budget process, our insurance rate review, and kind of the goals of the all-payer model um, and ACO oversight, certainly. Um, and then again, you know, this statewide healthcare data analytic element. So as a proxy for Medicare, you know, the, the board is the one who establishes the Elena, 
Yeah. Elena, I'm going to, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, you fine. have a little um, like thing up on your screen. Um, oh, okay. It's blocking part of it. And okay. I think, yeah, there you go. Thanks. Okay. No problem. Um, so the board establishes the healthcare spending targets. Uh, so in the Medicare ACO initiative on behalf of Medicare, um, the board sets that benchmark or that threshold against which the ACO is measured and which shared savings or losses. So that risk component are determined. Um, and, and then we measure kind of progress towards the, um, towards the goals of the model. Uh, we recommend, and as I mentioned before, the program design modifications along with our other um, co-signatories. So that would be something that, you know, the board would identify, you know, as Ina mentioned, um, some of the payment mechanisms in the Medicare program aren't as progressive as perhaps the Medicaid program. And so that could be an opportunity to work together to make some suggestions um, to move us in the right direction. Um, in terms of regulatory alignment, as I mentioned, you know, there's opportunities to make sure that um, the board's other regulatory levers are working in the same direction and kind of, um, you know, incentivizing or encouraging um, participation and monitoring and, and holding accountable our private um, healthcare entities. Um, in terms of the data analytics. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. That's I have okay. a clarifying question, um, if I may. Um, you said that the, the Green Mountain Care Board is the the proxy for Medicare. Does yes. that mean that you essentially represent them in the all payer model, and so negotiate on their behalf for this? We do not. We do not negotiate on their behalf. I think we're we're still so after the agreement is signed. I think the reason why they a lot of well all of the um, state level agreements they have require boards to participate regulatory boards. Um, and so it, they sit in the shoes of Medicare to ensure that the provisions um, of the agreement are kind of executed. And so, you know, I think one thing that they found interesting was Vermont's rate setting authority. I think Maryland has a similar um, authority. We don't use that authority right now, but, you know, there are, you know, right now our authority is limited or we focus on establishing these spending targets. So that healthcare system level budget um, that you know is okay but if the federal government felt like there was some problem with the way medicare was participating you would be the one they would talk to and they you would, they would serve. send us as probably as well as the other co-signatories you know a letter or notice you know as the scale target letter um, came to vermont it comes to the signatories um, so we're we're really you know, we can go through in detail what the um, kind of terms are and who's responsible for what in the agreement. But, you know, largely it's, we still act as the state, but the board has specific um, role, a specific role in establishing these targets and um, kind of regulating <laughs> against these targets. Got it. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, and feel free to keep chiming in. I'm happy to answer questions. I'm just trying to breeze through. Um, so in our healthcare data and analytics um, area, you know, we look at the state's performance under the model in terms of scale, cost, and quality and population health outcomes. We monitor for rationing and cherry picking and analyze patterns in utilization and costs over time across the delivery system. Um, so, you know, I just want to reiterate, there's kind of these three components under the all-payer model agreement that we're, that we're looking at. Um, and so, you know, I think Ina did a great job, so I won't spend much time here on kind of the total cost of care and the 3.5%. Um, it goes up to 4.3% before there's a triggering event. Um, and it's that, you know, over the life of the agreement, but there are kind of these annual um, assessments, if you will, for how we're, how we're progressing. Um, in scale, you know, we talked about the uh, attribution process there. So in, you know, just want to remind everyone the quality and population health measures that are included in our, in our agreement. You know, the key population health measures are improving access to primary care, reducing deaths due to suicide and drug overdose, and um, the prevalence of morbidity and chronic disease. There are then 22 quality measures underneath that, um, either process milestones or healthcare delivery system quality targets that kind of align to those population health measures. And these are the state's quality measures. Each payer has their own quality measures um, that align generally with these, 
you know, these goals, but they may have specific quality improvement areas that are important for their populations that they may also include in their contracting. So, um, you know, I think Ian talked about this a little bit before, but we do a legal review of those payer contracts to look for alignment in accordance with the all payer model agreement and recognizing that, you know, Medicaid serves a different population than Medicare, than from our commercial. So it may make sense for them to deviate on some measures. Um, but we do look at those um, quite, quite closely. Um, you know, to talk about how all of these different metrics and how do they stack up against each other, I think it's important to remember that uh, the total Vermont residents spend on healthcare is about 6.4 billion. Of that, you know, the all payer model total cost of care represents about 46% of that spend. And then of that, you know, there's another kind of chunk our ACO, um, the value base, or sorry, the total cost of care that the ACO is managing is really 849 uh, in 2019, 849 um, million. So it's about 13% of total spend. And then if you look further about, you know, this differentiation between the value base and the fixed payments, the fixed payments are really, you know, and this is the Medicaid um, chunk that I've shown you here, but there's also a, a little bit more in terms of the CPR program, which is the primary care um, capitated program that's again voluntary, but you'll see that it really only is you know, less than two percent of our total healthcare spend. So you know those dollars are important for allowing um, providers to really reinvest and rethink their business operations and, and achieve some of these goals. So without increasing prospective payments, it's you know we wouldn't expect to see huge deviations in delivery system. You know incentives are important, but having those flexible resources is probably likely to drive more, more change. Um, any questions there? Okay, and this just shows, you know, the dollars and the population, um, you know, while, you know, Medicaid may have a higher percentage, um, you know, the dollars and total cost of care are less than that of Medicare. And we know that some of our populations are sicker or require more resources. So we have to look both at at um, people, episodes, and, and dollars and utilization patterns. Um, these next series of slides, I, I will just breeze through them, but basically this is to show, you know, of the total cost of care, the regulatory control has increased over time because of this attribution, but, um, you know, there is there is still room to grow. So in, before the all pair model, we were about, um, 36%, we had regulatory control over some of the healthcare spending up to 41% in 2017, 46% in 2018, and 52% in 2019. There's still certainly 48% of the market that's not um, where there's little to no regulatory control. Um, another point to keep in mind, you know, I, you know, we love data and we want to make sure that our, our policy is informed by data, but one of the biggest challenges in healthcare is that we rely so heavily on claims data and it, it just takes a really long time um, for the patients to incur the claims, payers to pay and adjust the claims, the payers to submit the data, our contractor to clean and consolidate the data, and then finally to receive that data, validate it and, and kind of put it to work. Uh, so, you know, while you know, while we've you know, we've talked about total cost of care and, and some of the questions arose, where are we? How are we doing? Um, we have you know, we've presented 2018 results last year, and we have actually on the schedule next week to present uh, 2019 total cost of care and quality, and, and would love for you to join that if, if you're free. Next Wednesday on the 31st, we can send more details, but at that time, we'll kind of dig into a little more about what we're seeing and, and, and you know, where we think there may be opportunity um, to go next. Um, and so, you know, so here's our reporting timeline. As I mentioned, the total cost of care. Um, so we do have 2018 on our website. We have the total, um, the quality report from, and this, all the scale reports. Um, there's also the public health accountability framework where AHS is the lead. Um, we had payer differential report that we worked on collaboratively. And then, um, you know, we do have this proposal for a subsequent agreement that's due in December, 2021. And so while the board um, is named kind of the deliverer of this proposal. It's certainly a uh, work that, that all signatories are kind of um, working through um, together. Anything else you'd like to add there, Ina? Okay. Thank you. That's all I had. I breezed through it, but I'm happy to answer any other questions 
from the board's perspective. So um, as you're talking about, am I making a funny sound? No, no. okay. Um, I, I heard an echo, sorry. Um, uh, so as you're talking about rates and uh, sort of the, the rate setting um, authority that the board has, but has not used, it does bring to mind some of the issues that we were have looked at in the past and that become difficult. And that is the resolution of how do you, how are rates set between private and public entities? So uh, per, um, payers, right. and how do you, how do you sort of resolve the differences there? Right. So I, I, you know, as Ina mentioned, Medicaid sets their rates and it's through those payer contracts that providers, um, you know, can see or negotiate their either fixed payment or their, their fee for service. And so through participating in the ACO, providers can either elect that fixed payment or they can elect to continue for that fee for service um, payment, whatever is negotiated with that payer. Uh, so the ACO right now is our mechanism through which these fixed payments are, are negotiated. So it and how do you how do you know if a self-insured organization is it uh, you know is is utilizing the um, fee for uh, fee for service or the value-based payments? It's a good question. I mean, so we it, it, we rely on their self-reporting um, right now in in the cures. So so that is a that is a challenge. Is that a public is that public information? Um, when they report it, yeah, there is there is a public element to that. Okay, and I think Senator Hardy, you had a question earlier about meeting uh, budget uh, growth targets. Did you want to ask that one? Yeah, I mean, I think Ina was getting to that toward the end of her presentation, and then we switched over to Elena. I mean, I have I have your your Look, I, slide. I think it might be a you were talking about it, it the, three point, the three point five percent cap on growth and whether or not that's been achieved. And I think Ina said to switch it over to to uh, yeah. Elena. So we can. So we will talk about that next week. What I can tell you okay. is that um, it says three point five to four point three percent. Little preview: it will be four point four percent in twenty nineteen. Okay. Um, but we know that 2020, there is a significant reduction in utilization because you know, people are just less likely to go get services during the pandemic. So we, you know, we believe that over the life of the agreement, it will still you know, fall into those parameters, but it, you know, there's certainly opportunity. Um, and as Ina kind of highlighted, and we talked about and, and shown in the, in the graphs, the fixed payment component is really so low and scale is really has been a challenge. And, and these might be why we haven't seen the kind of um, reductions in growth that, that we anticipated in this model. But you know, these are all speculative and require evaluation and, and further analysis. I think it's also- Go ahead, sorry. The, the aggregate over the five years is also very important um, because in the, as we're observing, um, certainly the pandemic highlights the, the potential for some significant year to year variation. Um, and so I think really what we what we want and why we have a five year aggregate target is is because we want to see over the course of time moderation um, and there it, there can be uh, particularly um, with with healthcare spending um, some some, more noise in the short period be, you know, year over year. Well, and last year would be the noisiest, wouldn't it? <laughs> or, the, or the quietest, <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. depending on, but yes, yeah, so and from the data perspective, yeah. Yeah, so I, I have another question, but Senator Hardy, why don't you go right ahead? Yeah, so to pair with that, we're, we're not quite meeting the spending percentage targets. Um, are we meeting the population health goals and the sort of outcome goals? Good, yeah, that we was can... my question. Who's, who's oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> very good, very good. 
And we will, <clears throat> excuse me, we will dig into those results next week. Um, but, you know, we have seen progress in some areas and there are certainly opportunities in other. And I know that's not, you know, there, there are 22 measures. So I think it would, it would behoove us to look at those in more detail to, there's not just a, yes, we're good or no, we're bad. It's really, you know, there's always room for improvement and the data show that we have made some improvement, but we should talk about where we can go next. What is the thing next week and what time is it? Oh, I'm sorry. It's the board meeting. The staff will be presenting the total cost of care and the quality of results um, for, for the all-payer model results for 2019. Um, I can send the time and details to, to you all. Um, yeah, that, that would, would be, be great. Good. Chances are we're not going to be able to come, but just on the off chance that we can, it would be interesting to at least pop in and, and hear I the believe it's I believe Zoom. they're recorded too. It's Zoom yeah. and we've got a YouTube recording. They can go out and look at those. They're kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> really? Like watching, right, it's like watching our <laughs> committee oh, meetings, Ellie. It's better. I'm sure it's a blast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get some okay. popcorn and watch them. <laughs> there you go. But don't invite anybody else. They won't come. <laughs> So no, but but listen, the sort of the question uh, around the quality metric analysis that is done at the ACO, but then the assessment of whether or not targets have been reached is that done by? Well, yeah, so that there there are we have a quality framework in the all payer model, and then the ACO. So that's not with the ACO. That's just between the state of Vermont and Medicare, um, and then there's the ACO payer contracts that have their own quality metrics. And that's what we check for alignment to the ACO program. And then the ACO kind of sets those goals, right? And then has a quality improvement framework. So they, they're they working against those payer contracts. And so that alignment between the payer contracts and the state's quality framework are really what drives that. But, you know, Ina can talk to all the other work that's happening. That's really about, you know, because this, the all pair model quality framework is not just the ACO. Um, it's all the work that's happening in Vermont to really affect these outcomes. So uh, we, we need to, we need to close, but I, uh, it seems to me, I mean, my, I always, I think that the work that's going on is headed in a, in a visionary direction to, to incorporate our designated agencies, our, our social service organizations, our long-term care organizations, I think our home visiting is just, uh, and having care management so that patients don't get lost in a polyglot system. But it does seem to me as we listen about the quality metric analysis and, and uh, evaluation that there must be a way to simplify some of this uh, because the ordinary human is going to have a hard time sorting it all out. Um, that, and then uh, I, we've 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 talked with the ACO many times about simplifying the message. So we'll be back. We'll come back to this. We we very much appreciate all the work that you put in to to bring this to us. Uh, you as usual, you both do an exceptional job and greatly appreciate it. So we'll, we will come back to this. The committee is all excited about it. Uh, well, yeah, I am. Can, I we, can we get like a little download of your brain to, or a chip or something? So because so, you, you understand it better than anyone else we talk to. So thank you both. It's good. Thanks so for they, having us. they are the experts. Um, so we're, we're gonna, we need to switch off. We're going to a joint uh, assembly on um, judicial retention, I guess it is, right? Mm -hmm. Good, we'll get the vote back. So thank you.